Hello, and welcome to the Mystery Barn Podcast. I'm Heather, and thank you for joining me today as we dive into our first case. As is the nature of true crime, this program may contain information that is not suitable for listeners under the age of 13. Please use your discretion. You can listen and follow this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or several other podcast platforms. You can also follow me on Twitter at Mystery Barn Pod. With that out of the way, let's get started. Halloween. For many, the thought of Halloween invokes happy times and imagery, the smell of an autumn night, the joy of children's laughter, the costumes, and the unofficial kickoff of the holidays to come. But by night's end, on October 31st, 1969, two girls would go missing and never be seen or heard from again, and two families would be left heartbroken with unanswered questions that still continue today, almost 52 years later. Patricia Ann Spencer, or Patty as she was referred to, was born on January 10, 1953. She was 16 years old when she would go missing. At the time of her disappearance, she was approximately 5 foot 3 to 5 foot 5 and weighed 120 to 130 pounds. She had medium length blonde hair and blue eyes. She was wearing a brown or tweed plaid skirt, a brown sweater, and a gray and green plaid jacket. She had on brown shoes with thick heels. She wore a necklace that was decorated with a peace sign and had one known scar on her leg from a previous dog bite. Pamela Sue Hobley was born on May 24, 1954. She would be just 15 years old when she went missing. At the time of her disappearance, she was between 5 foot 6 and 5 foot 8. She weighed approximately 100 to 115 pounds. She had long brown hair and brown eyes. She has two distinctive scars, one across the bridge of her nose and the other to the left of her mouth. I have also heard the scar by her mouth being referred to as a birthmark, so I'm not sure if it's a scar or a birthmark. She wore glasses, but did not have them with her at the time of her disappearance as they were in for repair. She was last seen wearing a white faux fur coat with brown trim. She had a brown and white plaid skirt and a long sleeve blouse that had ruffled cuffs. Her shoes are described as chunky and she had on white cotton knee socks. The location where they went missing was in a little rural town called Oscoda. Oscoda is located in the northern part of the Lower Peninsula in the state of Michigan. It definitely classifies as a typical rural small town. In 2021, this town has a population under 7,000 people. I was not able to get a specific number for the population in the year of 1969, but did find some stuff that indicated that the population was well under 1,000. A key thing to note, although not sure if it has any relevance in this case, is that there was also an operating Air Force base known as the Wurtsmith Air Force Base that housed upwards of 3,000 people nearby this town. The Air Force Base has since shut down and is now a public airport that is known as the Oscoda Wurtsmith Airport. I bring up the Air Force Base because this would bring others to the area that would be unknown to the residents of the town. But you get the idea. This was definitely a small town. In fact, I saw references that stated that this town was incorporated in a, as a village in 1885 and then later unincorporated in 1919 after fires destroyed much of the area. I think it is now referred to as an unincorporated community. Bottom line is, it's a small town, which in 1969 would have been even smaller than what it is today, the type of town where everyone knows everyone's business. On the day of their disappearance, there were some reports about a bomb threat that was called into the high school around 2 p.m. The students were ushered from the building as a precaution. The two girls may have skipped school at this time, as there were witness reports that state that they were last seen walking together away from the Oscoda High School, which is located on River Road. It is interesting to note here that the reports say that they were seen walking together. While both girls knew of each other, it has been said on numerous occasions that these two were not known to be friends. I don't know what significance this could have, if any, but it's definitely an interesting point. If they weren't friends, what could have led these two to just take off together? I tried to find more information into this, but found mostly speculations and nothing that seemed to be concrete. We do know that neither girl had a purse or any type of ID with them. 
They also did not have any additional clothing with them that could possibly indicate that this was a planned excursion. The families have said that nothing was out of place in the home that could possibly have indicated that the girls were up to something. Both girls did have similar plans for the day. They had school and their high school homecoming football game to attend to. In addition, there was also a Halloween party that both girls had been invited to. The girls' families have dated that neither one of them showed up to the game or the party. I've read reports that said that Pam was possibly involved in things her family didn't necessarily approve of, namely drugs and alcohol. She was known to like to party. From what I could tell, Patty was definitely the quieter of the two, which again leaves me to ponder what could have sent these two girls to take off together. Pam had a boyfriend that she was serious about, that she had accepted a marriage proposal from. I couldn't find anything definite on him. I saw a couple of things that said he was older, but nothing definitive enough to say for sure. As far as I can tell, he had been cleared of any involvement in their disappearance. Their disappearance wasn't discovered until into the evening on October 31st. Pamela Hobley had told her family that she would be returning home after the game and Halloween party. While I didn't find much on the boyfriend, I did see that he was one of the first to inform her mother that she had not arrived at the party. This call prompted her mom to reach out to other parents, and it was at this time that it was discovered that Patricia was missing as well. The police were contacted, and it became a missing person investigation. In the beginning stages of the investigation, police seemed to be leaning more towards the theory that the girls had decided to run away with the intent to travel to Flint, Michigan. While running away is sometimes a viable theory, it doesn't make any sense why two girls who were not friends would just up and decide to run away together. As indicated earlier, they also did not bring along anything that would point in this direction. Things like ID, purses, clothing, money. Both families have stated that the girls were close to their families and had many positive things going on in their lives. Pamela had recently accepted the marriage proposal from her boyfriend and um, just doesn't seem like the type of behavior of someone who had been planning on skipping town. With rumors circulating that the girls had probably gotten a ride and were in Flint, many people, including the authorities, believe that this to be the most likely scenario. However, as time went by, it became clear that they had either been kidnapped or met with foul play, as no one had any further contact with either of the girls. Once the focus of the case went from runaway to suspected foul play, police ramped up their efforts and notified law enforcement agencies around the country about the missing girls. Later, a witness would come forward and say that he picked up the two girls on River Road and dropped them off at the gas station in downtown Oscoda. What's interesting about this is in a later interview, the man said that he was questioned at the time as he came forward shortly after their disappearance. However, none of this shows in the initial report. I'll speak more on this later. Investigators on the case began to speculate that the girls may have decided to continue hitchhiking and ended up being abducted. But without anything further to really go on, this is kind of where everything seemed to come to a stop. Many years would pass without anything. Families of the girls would put up missing posters all over the area. As they would become faded, they would be replaced with new posters. The family would reach out to investigators, the media, and the community as they remained steadfast in their quest for answers and to bring the girls home. Sadly, Patty Spencer's mom, Arlene, passed away in 1991. Pamela's parents and grandparents would also pass on before knowing what became of their daughter. I wasn't able to locate any information on Patty's father, so I'm not sure if he is still living. Pamela's sister, Mary Burley, and apologies if I am pronouncing this wrong, remains very active in trying to locate her older sister. She regularly participates in events centered around Michigan missing persons and has made public appeals over the years. They have lived with this hanging over them for decades, hoping for some bit of information that will help them get closure and find their much beloved sister. When speaking about the girls, she says they are still very much cherished and missed to this day. I cannot imagine the heartbreak of living with this for so many years, wondering and struggling with all the could have been, trying to move forward in life with one foot always stuck in the past. Chief Mark David, the current Oscoto police chief, in 2010 renewed efforts into finding the girls. He was only 12 years old at the time the girls initially went missing. He says that this case was always on the minds of the community. Since renewing it, he has said there have been new leads and that he has been working with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children to try and generate a new case profile and get things looked at with sets of new eyes. Many of the people around the time of Pam and Patty's disappearance have passed on, which has made investigating difficult. However, as new interviews are being conducted, new information does come to light. One thing that seems to be prevalent is that many things that were not present in the notes at the time of the initial investigation. 
The man who came forward about picking up the two girls up around 2 p.m. and dropping them off at the gas station where he worked as an attendant is a prime example. He came forward again in May of 2013, and Chief David conducted a new interview with him and found that a lot of the information that he initially provided to the police was not included in their reports. It definitely seems that mistakes were made, and going through the old files could potentially up new avenues and answer some questions. Another example of tips that were not investigated or followed up on was one that was received in 1985. For years, there was a story that was brought up many times in different variations that said how the two missing teenagers were buried in a Wilbur Township barn. Chief David even recalls hearing the story as a teenager himself and also during his early years as a police officer. In 1985, an anonymous tip was given to the police department, which at that time was known as the Oscoda Ostavo Police Department. This is the same department that is known today as the Oscoda Township Police. The person said that the two were taken and murdered by two area men and then buried by a barn on Brooks Road in Wilbur Township. There was nothing further in the report to indicate this tip was ever investigated. David came across it while going through the files and took action on this in 2011. The location of the barn and the property were well known to kids at the time of the disappearance as a place for youth horse shows and a teenage hangout. It was known to host some wild parties and was very popular among the younger crowds. David was able to locate the site of the old barn, which after so many years had significantly deteriorated and fallen down. Not much was left of the old barn, but the roof still remained and there was a concrete slab that was still there. Neighbors volunteered use of their equipment and the area was cleared of debris. Even though many years had passed, Chief David reached out to the Michigan State Police Canine Unit in Lansing to see if the area could be checked over with cadaver dogs. While there had been so much time that had passed, they thought it was still worth a try. A search was organized and the dogs were brought in. This proved to be unsuccessful and no evidence of human remains were detected at the scene. However, given the amount of years that had passed, this was not surprising. According to Chief David, further excavation examinations will be conducted at a later time. DNA and dental records have also been obtained for the girls as being compared against unidentified remains that are currently in the database. As interviews and new tips occur, Chief David remains hopeful that this case can be solved. If anyone has any information, no matter how seemingly insignificant, please reach out to the Ascota Township Police Department at 989-739-9113. Again, that number is 989-739-9113 or email otpd at oscotatownshipmi.gov. You can also call Crime Stoppers of Michigan at 800-773-2587 to leave an anonymous tip. When people go missing, the lives of all around them are thrust into a nightmare, a nightmare that you never awaken from. While finding the missing loved ones can bring some sort of closure, you are still left with gaping voids from where that person filled your life. In the case of the missing people that are never found, the nightmare rages on and on until their questions are answered or they take their last breath never knowing the truth of what happened. My heart aches for these people. It also fills with an anger knowing that someone out there knows something. Someone has been living with a secret for decades. They go about their daily lives and one can only hope that some part of them lives with grief and torment for what they have done. Thank you for joining me on this first episode of the Mystery Barn Podcast. If you have any comments, feel free to share below or reach out to me at mysterybarnpodcast at gmail.com. If you have any ideas or would like to see a particular case covered, feel free to reach out. You can also connect with me on Twitter at mysterybarnpod. Thank you and until next time. The sources used for this podcast are the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, CBS News, Osco County News Herald, the Oscoda Press, the Charlie Project, Wikipedia, and FBI.gov. For additional sources, Please see the show notes.